Earlier this week, I ran a social experiment of sorts, a social media experiment to be more accurate, and the results were not all that surprising. Here today to discuss this with me is Wes, aka SloopDupe. He'll help me decode if this is merely a generational issue or if there's something more to it overall. We're then going to use that as a jumping off point for a larger discussion. Has the evolution of TCG culture gotten to the point where it's actually starting to stifle some individuals' personal growth? A huge shout out to our channel members for supporting what we do here. If you want to get involved with the channel and the Dice Commando community, please consider joining as a channel member. Remember, these videos are only possible with your support. You can show that support with a like, a subscribe, and by leaving us a comment and sharing your feedback. Community first, and go Commando! Hello everyone, and welcome back to Dice Commando and a very special Go Again, a fabulous cast. So today we're having a discussion about TCG culture and the potential impact it has to us collectively as individuals. And joining me here on the channel once again to help me provide counterpoints is Wesley, aka SloopDupe. How are we doing, sir? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing all right. Uh, we had to do this super early morning. I know it's, you know, you're a couple hours ahead of me, but... I'm just waking up and getting everything together, but I really appreciate you making the time on your weekend to to do this. Oh, absolutely! I just thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. All right. Well, how has uh, how's life been? It's a uh, about it's a couple months since heavy hitters. Where are you sitting with everything? Uh, well, in terms of heavy hitters, I mean, I have my uh, I've got my my beautiful Kasai deck right here. Uh, you know, fully tuned. I've been enjoying it. I lost to a Riptide last night because, of course, my buddy plays Riptide. It's like one deck that nobody plays. So I decided to make a small change so I can, you know, burns of the past. Um, you know, changing my sideboard to my personal meta, not the the Pro Tour meta that everybody talks about. Um, but yeah, no, it's been good. I've been enjoying Prism as well with a new weapon. It's it's been a blast. But you know, it's cost. A fair amount of money when you're building a new deck from a new set, but you know, um, and then getting new PC and everything. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to just not having to spend money for a couple months until part of the Miss Veil comes out. There you go. Well, you know, from the from the Riptide thing, I always pack a Decimator Great Axe in every single Warrior build I have, and I just fatigue fatigue the big green boy. So that's my sideboard choice. That's yeah, that might be a little bit better. I don't know. I just, I found that Burdens of the Past, I mean, for Kasai, it's a blue block three. It, uh, you know, if Riptide has 10 or more traps in his graveyard, which are defense reactions, but he's going to because it's Riptide at the near the end game. Uh, he can't play any of the ones in the hand that share the same name, which is pretty much his whole hand. And then it also, if they have 10 or more, you draw a card. So it's like, you're, you're, it's just perfect for Kasai. It just seems like the perfect out. I, I got pinged three times in a single turn, which killed me against him i was gonna kill him on a swing and then it was like three traps i died so i was like okay if i have burdens that that just doesn't happen so hopefully fingers crossed it works yeah i mean fair enough it's it's i've seen a lot of people playing that uh, also in the olympia the, the recent olympia build that did very well mm -hmm. so all right but we are not here to talk about decimator great x and all that as much as we could make a whole cast on that but so last week i ran a uh, social media experiment of sorts and um so what I what I had done is I had shot about a week ago a kind of a pseudo response video to a lot of the Kano discussion that was happening, talking about Arcane and its place in the game. And I thought it was really well done discussion, at least, maybe not a well done video, but I thought it was a well done discussion. And it did not do very well, which surprised me given the, you know, social media discussion in the time about Arcane damage and all that. I thought it was going to get more clicks. So what I did is I then did, I'll put up the thumbnail right now, and I put this on the Twitters, and as you can expect, one got a lot more clicks on the Twitters than the other did. Um, now, I don't think that, I mean, that's, is that surprising to you? If you compare these two, is it surprising that one got more clicks than the other? Uh, no, because right. uh, different thumbnails, different topics will always get more clicks than others. Right. Yeah. So it, it didn't really surprise me, but it was more um, trying to gather the data. Now, as we go into the discussion about this, I want to be clear, the folks who, you know, by and large, the folks on my channel aren't necessarily because they're watching this, they're not necessarily the clickbaity type as much as, as others. But as a society, we definitely fall into the clickbaity stuff, right? There's, there's zero, zero question there, right? So um, what what are your thoughts on the experiment results here? Does it surprise you? And, you know, what's your take? Um, I guess if I'm looking at the two, so the first is like why arcane damage sometimes feels unfair versus the super awesome mega fun time best deck ever win every game. 
Um, obviously, the one is clearly hyperbole, uh, where you know it's uh, obviously over the top. So I think just the the funniness of it, and you've got the Home Alone kid. I can't remember Macaulay Culkin, I believe is his name. You know, you've got him doing the this face. So I think you know that might be why people clicked. It's also a question of like, are people interested in the deck tech that you actually did? Um, and whereas the why arcane damage sometimes feels unfair, is like it could also be just the the title itself maybe wasn't as appealing to people. Because mm-hmm. I find with thumbnails you the goal with a thumbnail and title is to intrigue people so you usually you ask them a question or you're offering them uh, uh, like a solution to their problems whereas like for deck techs for instance when you tell somebody that this is the best deck what they see is they're having an issue and that issue is i'm not winning in flesh and blood i'm losing games they see this is the best deck and so essentially that's selling them the solution of this deck solves your problem of not winning games and so I think that's why people tend to click on those videos more, whereas the conversation about Arcane Damage, I mean, the conversation was being had on Twitter, but that doesn't really mean uh, it was going on uh, on YouTube. Plus, it, it, you could have, for instance, maybe would have gotten more views if you said um, why Kano was broken. Like, I think that video would have actually been, and then the topic is about Arcane Damage itself, with Kano as the main focal point, that probably would have been a video that did better than the just why Arcane Damage sometimes feels unfair. Because mm-hmm. it's a little bit more hyperbolic you know and a little bit more to the point and that would probably intrigue people a bit more so yeah i mean that's that's good feedback on the um the selling and the marketing which i i sometimes admittedly don't don't do very well um but you know th- this discussion is not necessarily about the the youtube side of things i i really want to ask you know why do we you know you and i were talking in the in the pregame and one of the gists of why I wanted to talk about this is I actually really have a lot of respect for many of the people that play these type of games, right? By and large, I inherently believe, and I think most of us believe, that we're smarter than the average bear, right, compared to the rest of society. So why do we... I'm always surprised when we have... Again, like I said, I I have very high expectations for or higher expectations for these people because I believe them to be smarter. So sometimes when I see that mass behavior, it surprises me. And maybe it shouldn't, right? Maybe it shouldn't Um, because we're still society, right? We're still Mm -hmm. the internet. So maybe maybe that's that's the case. Um, But it, it really led me into a realization of sorts, which I've been kind of getting to anyway. Do players on the whole, do they want to learn how to play or do they want to be told how to play? I think it depends on player to player. Um, I will say I really do think that a lot of people do want the easy answer. They just want to be told this is the deck, this is how to play it, and then they just pilot it the way they were told and it, it you know expedites their ability to you know actually win uh, with minimal effort. But... I don't I don't necessarily know if that is a signifier of people's lower intelligence or that they're trying to bypass it. I think it's uh, an aspect of the time that it takes to do these things when people have lives. I mean, Flesh and Blood is a game full of mostly adults. So if they, uh, you know, if they've got a job, they've got a family, other things to do, they might not have as much time to, to build and learn how to play decks. But I think it's also human beings, we naturally gravitate towards the... Uh, path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. So if we can watch a video that tells us how to play this deck, like for instance, this Kasai list is just, uh, you know, it's a, an upgraded version of, and my, like I've made some changes to the uh, Hartford, I believe the Calling Hartford, or was it the Battle Hardened Hartford second place Kasai deck? Um, and I, you know, I watched the hour long video that they did where he went over every choice and went over the deck and it helped me to quickly understand the build, understand some of the strategy. And then I took it and was able to, you know, save myself, let's say 10 hours of time of play testing it all myself and then build upon from there. So I do think that there is that aspect to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, you know, to address something you said, just to remove any confusion, I am not saying that that is actually a lack of intelligence. I actually... I think that's the other part of it is because I I think that these players by and large, the our community by and large, I think again has higher than average intelligence, and that's why it, and that's how it fits into the question, right? It's not that I think people aren't smart enough and they just need it fed to them. I think they are smart enough to figure it out. So I'm curious why they don't want to figure it out. Does that make more sense in terms of framing the discussion? It's it's yeah, a small so, distinction, oh, but it's an important so, one. 
Yeah, so just like, so what you're asking is why do people want to watch a video that tells them how to play rather than actually going through the process of learning it themselves? I mean, if they're yeah. able to. Right. I mean, um, if I, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I really, I, I think it is just, you know, how, how much do you care? Um, because, you know, for instance, I am playing Monster Hunter World again, and I love the game. I beat it before. I was way into it when it came out in 2018, but it's been several years. I'm going back to it, but because I have the YouTube channel, because I'm playing Fab, I don't have nearly as much time to devote to the grinding and to learning every little aspect and mastering everything. So I'm, you know, I'm watching some videos to give me tips and figure some things out without me having to put the time and effort. I'm able to do so, but I'm not willing because it's just not as important to me. And I think Flesh and Blood is that way for a lot of people. Now, mind you, when you get to the pro side, I really do think it is just a matter of, you know, making it as easy as possible so you can you can learn as much as possible in a small period of time. So being able to learn from a coach who can run everything through, let's say, because uh, I did get coaching once and uh, uh, from Philp Bay, and he had told me that essentially he played 50 games of this hero so i didn't have to and i could learn from what he learned and then i could just you know start start from like a higher starting point it's the same thing with uh chess for instance you know they say that a chess a new chess player today is going to be better than the chess masters from 50 years ago because that person can learn from those people and then keep expanding upon that uh, as he moves into the future so I think that's just naturally why people are willing to take the shortcuts to learning things rather than doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 fair. And then, sure, there's the time component you brought up as well. Um, but, you know, I think you said something in your your Kasai. You said you watched the hour-long deck tech. Mm -hmm. There are a very... I mean, if you look at video viewing rates, most people only view videos for two to three minutes, right? Sure. So I, I, again, I think you're one of the exceptions to that just because, <clears throat> excuse me, just because a video has a thousand clicks or whatever, doesn't mean that that video got watched a thousand times. It means that people clicked on it to get the deck list a thousand times. Right. True. So, I mean, but that's, that's society, I guess, like I just said, sometimes I just have higher expectations of the TCG community because I, I believe we're collectively more capable. Right. And then the, you know, to bring us back to the thumbnail thing, you know, the, the thumbnail, sure, it has to sell it on all that. But, um, you know, you look at like D DM Armada, right? Steven does a phenomenal job. He doesn't have to relate to, you know, super awesome, mega fun time content and people still watch his stuff. Your thumbnails are very good. You do the, you know, like the speech bubbles and stuff. And that's kind of your hook. But you're not saying like, inflammatory things to try and bring people in. Um, so, you know, people, I think, still want to, the people who want to consume it, consume it. But by and large, people will click on super awesome, mega fun time, super cool, whatever. Um, so I think that maybe brings us to kind of a larger conversation about TCG culture. And in going through this, I just want to, you know, address the viewers out there, right? I, I've asked Wes specifically to be here as a counterpoint, right? Wes is a, you know, he's younger than me, different generation than me. So I think he brings a very different perspective. And I think he also is here to keep me, keep me honest on this and not just be again, that old man shaking a fist at the cloud. So I, again, I really appreciate you, you being here for that. Um, so as, as I mentioned, Wes, right. I really think that a lot of these people in these games are higher than average intelligence, um, mm. especially compared to like the normal population, right? But I do think that there is a good portion of the culture of TC or of the folks in the TCG culture and gaming culture, I suppose, to a certain extent, who are potentially not realizing, potentially not realizing their full potential. And I want your take on it. it do you think that's true or not? And then does it, is it TCG culture that causes that? Is it the folks who are attracted to TCG culture are naturally that way? And let's, let's, let's talk through this. What are your, so what are your, what are your thoughts on kind of the thesis statement there? 
Um, so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on this. So my understanding of what you're basically asking, and this is something that has been lauded at video games, for instance, or mm -hmm. a lot of other things, is it definitely here in the West, at least, it feels like we are a growing consumer uh, society where people want to, you know, not really spend a lot of time building real life skills, doing things that are difficult, you know, uh, you know, working a, a hard job and moving their way up. And it's, you know, a lot easier to just work your job, come home, you turn on your computer or your game console, you play a video game or you you play a card game or you just you know you you escape it's escapism right it's doing that instead of struggling through the real world um and there's obviously the addictive tendencies of these things like people buying booster boxes and cracking boxes because it's it's just so much fun and what they can get and then um you know when you're when you're involved in these things where it's a great hobby and it's really good to do on the side there i think is a valid question of you know how how much time are you giving to these hobbies versus how much time are you actually spending on your real life? Like, you know, I think it's also valid to say, uh, you know, you might have a really good deck and you're good at playing the game, but is your 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 room clean? Is your place clean? Like, do you have a ton of dirty dishes piled up in your kitchen all the time? Is your place stink a little bit? Are you, you know, are you just kind of a mess in every other aspect of your life? Uh, because I do think there's, and, and I'm guilty of this myself too at times, especially when I was younger, where, I would just play games all the time. I, my place was a bit of a mess. Laundry would be just in a pile on the floor. You know, I didn't fold it and put it away. Uh, you know, I didn't take care of myself as much as I should because it was just more fun to come home and play Magic the Gathering or play a video game. Um, so I do think there is an aspect of that, but I don't necessarily think that it is a consequence of TCGs on their own. I think it's just kind of a mentality societal wide mm -hmm. like of people wanting to escape and i think it's i think it's just that games have gotten really 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 fun you know um and and it's very low effort you just come home and you hop on talishar it's a quick like 10 seconds and you're there you can start playing the game if you want you know in person is a bit different but or you can watch a video or you can you know look at some deck lists or you can engage with the hobby in an instant. So the fact that it's so easy, I mean, you don't even need a computer. You just open up your phone, you can go on YouTube and start watching stuff. So I think it's the ease of access and almost the dop dopaminergic hit of it that causes people to put way more time into these hobbies. I think we all know, we've all had periods of our life where it's like, you're playing a video game or a TCG, whatever it is, and you're like, I know I need to get this one thing done, but I'm just going to play this game instead. And then you're kind of stressed out about the thing that you need to get done. Uh, maybe, maybe it's even when you're in school, it's homework or something or a project you need to get done and you play a game instead or, you, you know, you go do something fun and then it starts to stress you out. And so to deal with the stress instead of dealing with the project you stress out you're like ah, i'm just gonna play some more games to you know feel better because now i feel stressed and this this relaxes me and it's almost uh falling too far into escapism mm -hmm. I, I do think that there is there is an aspect of that within the wider society um and tcg culture and and you know the fan bases are no different i think mm -hmm. yeah well they, they may they may be slightly different right i mean we if if you think about in your head what the uh not necessarily what you think the stereotypical gamer looks like, but if you were to go ask some random person in society what the stereotypical magic player looks like, right? It's probably some, it's like the comic book dude from The Simpsons, right? I mean, that's probably about it, right? I don't know what that guy's mm -hmm. name is, but. And that's not untrue, right? You know, if you go and you look at like the calling or something like that, it's going to be 900 just like normal people picture of picture of normal society in the room right but we definitely have those type of individuals attracted to tcg gaming or gaming in general to your point um so it's all I'm, I'm curious if it's is it like a cart horse thing like do we are we as because you mentioned like the dirty room and stuff and i thought that was a great a great point do tcgs facilitate that or do people who are interested in tcgs are like that I didn't ask that very well, but again, is it a cart or a horse thing, right? Do TCGs cause people to not pick up their laundry or are people who stereotypically leave their laundry on the floor attracted to TCGs? Does that question make sense? It, it does. I would say that the type of people who would prefer to play games rather than take care of themselves, who don't exactly have the best impulse control or aren't the most disciplined, um, they also are going to be attracted to sort of games. I mean, I think a great example is like phone mobile gotcha games, mm -hmm. right? Where you get people spending 
thousands of dollars just to pull some some you know uh, uh, anime girl that looks like she's 12 years old you know and, and skimpily dressed um and they they love that and they spend all this money and it's i think it's just people that would prefer to do things that are fun and play games and all that are also going to be attracted to something like video games or tcgs but i i would like to quickly point out though at least in flesh and blood I've, I've, listen, I go to my LGS and there's a couple guys there. I call them man children because they really are, they're adult men, but they're in their mid twenties, but they act like they're 15 year old boys. They, they prioritize video games and having fun over actually being responsible. They, they're not looking for relationships. They're not looking to build themselves up in life and actually build skills. They just want to work whatever job they can that pays the bills for now. And they don't really think of the future. They're not looking to ascend, but they just, they want to play games because it's fun and they, they, they indulge themselves in that hobby. But I also meet people and especially in flesh and blood who are like yourself or, or I have a friend named Joe and, and who are grown adults. They're looking to build themselves up in life. They have a good job. They're built, you know, uh, my friend is a manager at a Best Buy, like he makes good money, gets bonuses, everything else, you know, and he lives a good life. He's got a fiance. So it's, it's, you know, I do think Flesh and Blood especially has attracted a lot of very put together people. Um, I, If I'm being very honest, I think it's not even an issue with games and, and TCGs necessarily. I really feel like it's a society of adult children that we have. Like, I really do. I look around and it seems like there's a lot of people who don't want to grow up, um, whether it's by everything's gotten too easy. So they haven't had to struggle. Maybe there's a part of it of, uh, I think... You know, housing, especially here in Canada, at least, is very expensive now. So there's a lot more people staying at home with their parents rather than actually getting out there and being on their own and getting, to, you know, out into the world and living by themselves. And I know for myself, I was forcibly removed from my parents' place because the, my parents had split up and they separated and we lost the, the place we were living at. So I had to get an apartment. It was not a good period of time of my life. It was very much a struggle. But it made me grow up and made me grow into an adult and into a man and put me on the path of actually becoming an adult. But for those first couple of years, I was still a child. I was 18, 19 years old. I was a child still. I was like 15 years old in terms of my mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to forcibly grow up. And I think that there's an issue of a lot of people aren't really forced to grow up anymore. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just it's like this big culminating societal issue uh, where we do see more of these types of people in trading card games, in video games, and just in society where it's people, and, and it's not even just a men, men or women, I think it's kind of both, of people that just haven't really grown up. They're still, you hmm. know, have a childlike mentality through a, a myriad of, of reasons. Interesting. That's, that's an interesting take on it. And then do you think that those people end up in these games because of just the time available? Or is it, I mean, you spoke to this and I agree, these games are, do facilitate addictive personalities, right? When, mm -hmm. Which is good that people are doing this versus drugs or whatever. Like, that's a good thing. Um, but is, yeah, actually, that's, that's interesting. I see, I think I see where you're going with that. Um, so why do we think people, why do we think those individuals are attracted to the TCG as opposed to just like sitting at home on the computer and playing Mon Monster Hunter or whatever? Um, I think it's just, I don't think it's anything necessarily about TCGs. I think it's just because they're fun, you know, like collecting mm -hmm. cards is fun, having things. Personally, for me, you know, like I like video games, some video games, but I'm more into TCGs because I like the tactile experience of it. I like having my cards. I could sit here and go through them. Uh, you actually own something. They're, you know, they're shiny. I think the the value of cards is also a big thing. Like I like when I go through my deck and be like, ooh, this, you know, cold foil Valiant Dynamo that I have is going for like, I think TCG player had a cold foil because I put one in a cart just to see and it was like $400. It's like, hey, I own a $400 cart. That's amazing, right? Like that's, you know, I don't know if it's actually that price. It's probably lower in actuality. That's probably just the only listing. But, you know, I think there's a lot of aspects, you know, beautiful fantasy worlds. But I really do just think it's it's fun. You know, TCGs aren't as big as video games because they're a little harder to get into. You need other people to play them unless there's online. Um, there's also like the complexity of having to learn them. But, you know, I, I think it's, it really isn't anything necessarily different about TCGs than anything else. It's just the reason they've existed for over 30 years now as a hobby is because they're fun. People enjoy them. There's there's an aspect of it that is just engaging. And so I think it just attracts people. It's the same as like board games, you know. People still enjoy board games because they're fun, you know. And if something's fun, people will gravitate towards them. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'll challenge you on the board game thing. Not that people don't like them. People still like board games. But in terms of, I don't necessarily know that someone would say like, oh, I'm a Settlers of Kataner, right? But they might say I'm a Flesh and Blood player, right? And I don't think board games become as all-encompassing in your life as TCGs do, by and large. Um, I, I think your your analogy to video games, I think, is is apt. Um, yeah, I, I guess if I could say here, um, I think TCGs, the big thing about them is because they're ever evolving. There's constantly new sets coming out, new heroes, new, new cards, new things to engage with, new people to meet new, mm -hmm. like it's all that newness. I think a TCG could be akin to exactly. I think the best example is world of Warcraft, like any MMO that is constantly having new releases. There's constantly something to grind for and people treat trading card games like they would treat a game like world of warcraft where you know if there's a, a set or a new um, expansion for wow that people just they don't enjoy and they might play it for a while and be like I, okay i don't enjoy this and they leave the game for a while but then there might be an expand and they might leave permanently but then there might be an expansion three years down the line that they're mm -hmm. like oh, okay that looks good i'm hearing online that you know people are telling me that it's really good so i'm going to try it again and you see people engage with trading card games the same way where they will be engaged for several years some people will be engaged in magic for 10 years and then they quit because their life changes or they just stop having fun and then like the professor he quit for a while and then came back like 10 years later and started his channel and now it's his whole you know uh it's his whole business it's his whole life and i think I, again i really do think that you could say that tcgs and mmos are like basically the same thing it's just one's real life because there's constant newness with it and you know i i guess if we're going to the type of person attracted look at the type of person who plays you know uh mmos a lot i mean i don't know if you know the streamer asmongold very popular streamer very well-known mm -hmm. person but and he self admittedly, uh, he is he doesn't take care of himself. His room is absolutely filthy. He doesn't shower like he is. You know he uh, he's just that guy who doesn't want to do anything but game, and that's what he does. And it, you know I think it's just those type of people are going to be attracted to <clears throat> games that are fun and a form of escapism. I really think it's just if something is engaging and keeps you locked in, which I think games do. You know mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it just attracts that kind of person. Yeah. Yeah, and it facilitates them continuing to be that way. So maybe it mm -hmm. is a cart and or a chicken egg thing. Interesting. That's insightful. Um, one one of the things that I was thinking the TCG one of the one of the reasons I was thinking TCGs might be different than the online games was that people can get into the trading portion and you know tell themselves, well, well, I'm going to collect these and become rich and then spend time doing the selling and all that. But actually, people do do that on you know, your MMOs, they actually grind and then sell mm -hmm. stuff on eBay. So <clears throat> I had forgotten about, I hadn't considered that portion of it. The MMO is actually a really good analogy. Um, interesting. I but literally I, just, I, as we're talking, I just realized it like, wow, popped into my yeah. head. And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and in that case, I would say TCGs are better because they, at least in theory, make you get your stinky rear out of your chair and go to the game store. Right. Um, <clears throat> which may, may not be better for everyone around you, but <laughs> at least you're getting up and taking, just taking steps or whatever. No, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, I guess, the the thesis statement, I, I wasn't sure where this would go. And you, this is your, again, you're, this, I'm glad I asked you on here because this, this is already changing from kind of where I thought it was going to go, which is a good thing. Um, Part of the thesis of this was that I think there are a lot of people out there underperforming their potential, right? I mean, I've met a good number of people in the gaming world who I think are like, man, you are really smart. You're an amazing person. You could be doing so much more with your life. Um, and again, everyone's allowed to choose their decisions, right? Um, but what, what do you think it is about, let's just say gaming culture, or let's just say our society today? Fair enough. If we think that, you know, the TCG thing isn't separate. What is it about the folks that are attracted to this type of lifestyle is making them statistically or overall, not statistically, overall, maybe not want to realize their full potential? I mean, if I'm being very honest, I think it's just the very human thing of we try to take the path of least resistance. 
Um, we are living in a world that despite some issues, and there are a lot more issues that we didn't have to deal with in the past, especially a lot of psychological issues that we didn't have to deal with in the past, um, especially with the advent of social media. And, uh, you know, personally, I believe like our food source is being completely poisoned by ultra processed food, and it's like messing with our bodies and our brains. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's very easy to engage in a hobby, right? It's very easy to pick up your cards. Because again, it's it's the fact of like, I will sit here and I will just, even when I'm editing, if I have this here, I will like stop and I will just pull up my deck and just go through the cards. Because there's something really satisfying and fun about just looking through the cards. And be like, oh, this is my deck. These are my numbers. Like, can I change anything? I'll do that a thousand times before I even change a single card. But so same with video games. It's very easy and fun to engage in these things. And so I think the biggest thing is that we spend a lot of time with it. And I can say personally, when I'm playing video games, I am far less inclined to edit videos and actually produce anything because it's easier to get up at five in the morning and turn on Monster Hunter and play that for an hour and a half before I go to work than it is to come in here and edit a video for an hour and a half before I go to work. Right. And so there are mornings where I won't edit and i'll just do monster hunter and then i get a little bit behind and you know it's it's something that i am well aware of and i know in the back of my mind that it's like man i should be doing the difficult thing i should be doing the editing because it furthers my life in a way that playing a video game doesn't but it's very difficult sometimes when the video game is just way more instantly fun and i think it really is hmm. I, I really just think it's it's um I think it's just the way that we're wired. Like our brains are wired to want to do whatever feels really good and whatever's instantly gratifying. Because like, I don't know if uh, about people's religious beliefs, but if you do believe that we evolved as a species or even, you know, just before the modern the modern world we lived in, you know, things were really difficult. Like you wanted food, you had to go out and hunt or gather for it or grow it. But that took a long time, you know, you, you didn't. And so we were built to you know, you see a bush full of berries and you just go ballistic. Your brain would be like, oh my God, like there's a bunch of, you know, sweet fruit that we can go and pick and, and gather. And so I think that the world we have now is kind of works against that where it's, it's, our brains are built to want to do the fun, instantly dopaminergic thing. So you're going to gravitate towards that versus the difficult task of building a skill of spending years to get good at something, you know, like uh, if you look at my channel, you might think like, oh man, he's a good video editor. He makes very good produced videos, but it's like, I had to spend three years building those skills. Like mm -hmm. it was not easy at the start and I've had to sacrifice a lot. It's taken a very long time and I'm not even as good as I would like to be. You know, I don't have a channel with hundreds of thousands of followers. I've got just, you know, six and a half thousand. And so it's like, it's a lot of work and doesn't always pay off. And so I think it's, I think it really is just, it's people don't gravitate towards what's difficult. They just do whatever's easy. And I think a lot of us, myself included, we get trapped in the escapism and enjoying hobbies more uh, like too much like we spend too much time on those things and not enough time building those skills that are necessary for you know uh, building our way up through life and so I think that's kind of where a lot of us get caught in that um, and then we also surround ourselves with people who are doing the same thing we are where we're playing games you know and you know they encourage us like hey come out you know don't spend your night working or doing something important like come out and play the game with us you know, so I think it's, uh, I don't even think it's an intentional thing from people, but I think it's just the world we're built in and the environment around us kind of leads us into being engaged more with hobbies than doing difficult things that build our skills in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, you mentioned an important part there and it's hobby, right? These, for, for a very small percentage, it is their career or could be their career, right? Mm -hmm. 1% less than that of the flesh and blood community, right? of this gaming community. The vast majority of us have to have a job. Um, and these hobbies provide a place, an escape, something for us to do. And I'm concerned that for a larger portion than is probably healthy, folks are using it as their primary vehicle in life instead of an enhancement of their life. I guess that's, that's what concerns me when I see a lot of these folks. Not a lot, but so, so, I shouldn't say a lot of these folks. Not like there's some problem where all gamers are like sitting in their filth. That's that's not the picture I'm trying to paint, right? There's a lot of very successful people. You've had many of them on your channel. Very impressive people in this mm -hmm. game. Um, so how do you? How does one? And and again, I think this is where you are the expert for your generation, right? How do you balance having a hobby? and not having it become your life. Because again, these games are very addictive. 
and you said, like mm-hmm. you said, you can just sit and jam Chalashar, Chalashar all day. So how, how do you how do you strike that balance? And why do you think that some people are unable to do that? Um, so I guess there's two aspects to this. Um, the first is, I guess, kind of outlining why, like another reason as to why we, we go in these games and why we'll spend a lot of time um, building our skills, essentially, in this game. Like even trying to be a pro player, you know, there's a lot of people that will grind for hours and hours trying to be as good as they mm-hmm. can. And they're not actually going to win a pro tour or world championships. And they know this, but they're trying to be as good as they can. And I think it's because there's two things to it. The first is status. Human beings, we want to feel like we're, we have status, even if it's at your LGS. If you're known as the best player at your LGS, or you're the best like prism player, there's a status that comes with it. There's a bit of uh, you know clout that comes with it online if you're on somebody. And we naturally are attracted to that so even if it's in a small niche like i'm not gonna lie i recognize that my youtube channel is one of the bigger flesh and blood youtube channels even though it's tiny in the comparison to the big grand scope of youtube it feels really good that i'm one of the big guys in my small community so it's like hey that feels really good i feel like i have status and i think that's something we naturally gravitate towards the other thing is whether it's making youtube videos or trying to be good at flesh and blood uh you know and it's just the same with video games We also naturally like to feel like we're improving as people and it's quicker and easier to improve at a video game or to get a level up skill in a game or even in flesh and blood. Like you win a game, you feel like you've just improved a bit. It's a lot quicker to do that and easier to do that than it is to get really good at, again, like a real life skill that's like, even even if let's say, I'm going to use a woodworking as an example. Like Mm -hmm. in order to become somebody who's really masterful at woodworking, you can make beautiful furniture or beautiful things or sculptures or whatever it may be. You know, that takes years and years and years of work. But learning how to pilot a flesh and blood deck, as difficult as it can be, it's maybe a few weeks of like actual effort and talking to some people, watching some deck techs, reading some stuff online, spending some time with it. You can get really good at something like that quicker than you can get something, you know, that maybe is more real life applicable. Whereas like you work a good job, it could take years to build your way up and really become an expert at it. Whereas again, like something like flesh and blood, not as difficult. So I think there's that aspect as well. Um, and then I'm just, I'm just realizing though, I went on that tangent. Uh, what was the original point that you were asking me? I think it was, how do we, uh, oh yeah. How do we not let ourselves get trapped in that and actually, you know, work on, on things outside of that? Um, it's very difficult. I can say I'll use myself as the example of, you know, again, video games are very fun and I often will play a game rather than working on a video, even though I need to work on a video. Now I will still spend time every day, but I always have that voice in the back of my head that's like, you only worked on a video for an hour today. You could have done two hours if you didn't play a game for an hour, you know, and so there's that that balance. Um, I think a big thing is you first have to have like a sense of a goal or a purpose in life, you know, is is recognizing that while this game is fun, what else do you want to achieve? Do you want to have, uh, you know, a home? Do you want to have a family? Do you want to work at, you know, uh, building a community around you? Like finding something larger than yourself to aim for, I think is very important. And then um, cementing that as the goal. Like, for instance, the reason I can set down Monster Hunter and actually work on videos uh, like I've been doing all morning is, you know... Like, I want to be one of the bigger Flesh and Blood YouTube channels, not just to be the biggest, but it's like I want to help bring people into the game because I feel like this is a game that can change people's lives for the better. You know, it can meet new people, travel the world, like have a great experience, uh, become more intelligent, you know, learn some new things, experience new things. And it changed my life for the better. So I want to bring people into it. Um, But there's also the aspect of like, I do make a bit of money. And so, you know, when I make more YouTube videos and I improve and grow my channel, I'm earning more, which helps me in the goal of like, I would like to own a home. I would like to have a family. I'd like to be able to take care of them. It's nice that I have a hobby that pays me back. Mm -hmm. So even though it's not that I don't like editing, but honest to God, it's not as fun as playing Monster Hunter, right? Like sitting down playing a video game or going to hang out with my friends and playing Flesh and Blood, way more instantly fun than sitting and grinding through editing because you probably know this, a lot of editing isn't fun. There's parts of it that's really fun. Like when I'm doing some cool little keyframe, you know, thing in a video that's, that's you know, moving like a character around or something or being creative, it's fun. But the, you know, cutting a video down and getting all the takes into one, you know, cemented take and cutting all the pauses and that out, that part really sucks. Like, let's just be real. It's not fun. And so there is that force of like, I don't want to work. Like I want to do the fun thing, not struggle with the difficult thing. So having a reason to, uh, you know, do the difficult thing, I think is, is the most important aspect of it. You have to want 
to like you have to want the end goal of the struggle more than you want to do the fun thing i think is the best way to put it um if if i could expand just a little bit too i know this so i don't have children myself but i know i believe you have children obviously i know you've mentioned before and I, you can probably attest to this where not everybody but a lot of people find that there's like a switch that flips in their head when they have kids because all of a sudden you're no longer just living for yourself and now you have a reason to do difficult things because you have to take care of that child it's this sense of i don't want to go to work today but like i'm doing it and i'll work the extra hours because that means extra money that i can take home and give you know provide for my my wife and kids or provide for my family and so i think that that gives you a reason to get up every day i've heard that from parents where like they might have been you know a little lost in life and they felt like they didn't have much of a purpose they have a child and all of a sudden that's the reason for them getting out of bed in the morning and i think that's really what the goal is here is like you have to have a goal you're aiming for that forces you and gets you to want to do the difficult thing rather than you know play the game that is fun mm -hmm. yeah you know you, you said a couple of things i was jotting them down um the the when you know you when you're talking about so i i don't i don't necessarily want this to be about youtube and stuff like that right but mm -hmm. When you are doing your editing and stuff like that, right? You mentioned you want to have a house one day and all that, but that is not going, you are probably not going to accomplish that because of your YouTube income. If we are being honest with the time that you spend shooting, organizing, and editing, I saw the other day McDonald's near me paying $18 an hour. You would be way better off from an instantaneous standpoint going and working at McDonald's than you would be to use what you're doing to buy a house, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just realistically, right? I know what YouTube pays per thousand clicks and you can do the rough math, right? We're not getting rich from doing this. We're doing it because you want to. Now your point about learning the editing over the last three years, you could potentially have grown yourself. The skills you learned doing that have taught you things and it's made you grow right. and it continues to challenge you, right? That There's value in that. So I'm not, I'm not saying stop doing what you're doing, Wes, if you're trying to earn a house, go work at McDonald's. It's not what I'm saying. Don't Please don't take it that way. What I'm trying to say is that you put that time in with a goal, which I think is what you were saying. Okay. Now, the, the part of that that's interesting to me is we take that back to kind of the thesis statement or one of the first questions I asked you was, do people want to learn how to play or do they want to be told how to play? The data very clearly tells us in mass, people want to be told how to play because they want to click on a deck tech and get the deck link and then walk away. So how does how does how do we reconcile that, right? Because you are the you just talked about how you spent all this time doing all this editing. You were learning. You were teaching yourself a skill. You were not just recording it and throwing it up on the on right. So you you were learning how to play. Mm -hmm. Right. The analogy there, you were learning how to play. You were not being told how to play um so how how do you how do you reconcile that i guess is the the general question right in terms of i don't, I, but I don't know maybe i can't even ask you that question because you're someone who wanted to put in the time to learn right well i i think that's it right there though is that and I think it's perfectly fine is not everybody cares. Like there are people who do YouTube uh, for flesh and blood even, and they don't put a lot of time and effort because for them, it's just a hobby. It's just something they do on the side. They don't really care that much. They don't have like a specific goal. And then you get people that do have a goal where they're like, I would like to be big. I want to earn a bunch of money. And they don't, they're not willing to put the time and effort into it. And you know, that's, that's like a whole other separate thing, but it's kind of the same for flesh and blood where. Well, that's just creative. I mean, that's like you said, influencers, right? Everybody wants to be an influencer. Mm -hmm. So that's just influencer culture, but please continue. Sorry. Well, sorry. I just mean like even with uh, Flesh and Blood, like most people aren't trying to be a pro player. They're not trying to be the best of the best. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of like the people that have the goal of I want to be a top player. They're the ones who will spend all that time learning. I have a friend, my buddy Joe, I believe I mentioned him just earlier in this uh, conversation where he has this sense of like, I want to build my own deck. So he's playing, he's playing Victor. He played Riptide. He did Tekla Boston and he plays game after game after game, not looking like he'll look at other lists, but he never copies another list. He, his thing is like, 
I want to build my own deck and win with my build personally. And so that's a personal goal of his. And so he can't just copy a list online. He will struggle through games on Talishar day after day after day, losing over and over, trying to figure out how to actually make something work. But most players, that's not their goal. They just want a deck. They want to sit down at an armory. They want to win with minimal effort. And they that that's how they want to engage with the hobby. So I'm not necessarily... I don't know if I really think it's an issue or anything to be reconciled mm -hmm. with. I think mm -hmm. it's just how people choose to differently engage with the hobby. I mean, I'll be honest, I make small changes to my decks, right? This Kasai deck, but I'm the type of person where I will look at a list, I will make some small changes, and I will play it and, and test it a bit myself, but I don't spend nearly as much time building and deck constructing as as other people do because I choose to spend more of my time making videos for the game and so when it comes to the actual game itself and like playing i'm more than willing to to look at someone else's deck take 90 percent of it make some alterations change some cards you know people don't run the goblet of blood run wine but i love the card so i'm going to play it and you know make those those adjustments but i'm i spend way more time with the video side of things than i do with the gameplay side of things but that could be the same for a lot of other people where flesh and blood is just a hobby they just want to have fun with it they don't want to spend a lot of time learning to play because it's just not worth it to them and i think that that's just you know you look at magic most players are commander players they buy a pre-con they maybe upgrade a little bit they watch some fun videos they improve a tiny bit but they don't spend that much time on the game and i think that's just how i think that's how most people engage with most things in their life because you can only have one or two major hobbies like major important things to you and everything else you'll mm -hmm. do the easiest way to engage with it you know you'll play a video game unless it's something you're really really into you probably look at guides you probably uh you know will will find ways to get through a little quicker you might not do all the extra content you might like go on and play with other people so the fights are easier you know rather than grinding but there are some people let's say dark souls there's the ornstein and smau where there's two bosses i had the ability to get somebody to come in and help me online so i did because i couldn't get past them now, some people will say, I should have struggled and learned how to be really good at the game so I could beat those bosses and improved. And yeah, I would have been a better player for it. I just didn't care that much. Like, it just wasn't that important to me. And I think that's just the thing with Flesh and Blood. It's just not that important to people. So they're going to take the easiest way to, to do it. I see. No, I, I, think, I think that's insightful and probably accurate. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that is a good way to put it in context. Interesting. All right. Well, we've been going for quite a bit here. Um, this is, this is, I, I really want to thank you. This is, it's kind of a hard conversation from some aspects of it. It can be a hard conversation, um, especially when I'm not exactly sure how to frame it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, you, again, I want to be very clear. I look at a lot of these folks. I'm like, wow, you're really smart. Why are you not living up to your potential? And again, that's, that's in my eyes, looking at them, right? But to your point, they just might not want to. So, which is fair, which is fair. So, mm -hmm. all right. Anyway, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Um, do you have any closing thoughts or anything that you wanted to build on before we head out of here? Um, I think, I think the one last thing I want to say is that when it comes to people not living up to their potential, uh, you can, you can know this for people that you know very well, like friends, very close friends and family, you know, your partner, you can tell cause you know them as an individual, but at the end of the day, most people, I think most people will, if you're not living up to your potential, you'll have that nagging feeling in the back of your head. It might be a bit of shame. Like recently I'll, I'll, you know, I just use myself as an example. Uh, I gained a bunch of weight last year. I went from like 155 to over 190. And that was like, you know, cause I stop taking care of my health. I start, started eating more junk food and now I'm back on eating well and I've already lost like seven pounds. I'm back on my way to fitting into my nice, you know, waistcoats and that. But when I would look at myself in the mirror or I would think about it, I felt a bit of shame. Now, nobody else had shamed me, but I felt a bit of shame because I knew that I wasn't living up to my potential. And so, you know, a real good way of finding out whether you are or not is just paying attention to how you feel about yourself. If you're doing something and you're thinking about it and you're like, you're playing a video game and you've played for five hours today, or you're playing flesh and blood and you're, you know, you're, you've been playing for way longer. You're opening up more boxes and your bank accounts draining because you're spending money that you know, you don't have mm -hmm. and you feel bad about it. Don't ignore those feelings. Those feelings are telling you something and paying attention to them. That could be the point for you to change your behavior or at least to recognize that, you know, like when I felt bad about my weight, it wasn't, again, it wasn't that anybody shamed me, but I recognize like I am not living up to my potential. I'm capable of losing weight and eating healthy. I've done it before. 
why am I not doing it now? Like I'm letting myself do the more fun thing, which is eating pizza and, you know, McDonald's and all this junk food. It's more instantly gratifying, but in the long term, it made me miserable about myself. And I think that's the thing is if there is a balance, you can play video games, you can engage with the TCG, but if there's something in your life that you have a goal and you know you're not working on it hard enough, whether it's improving at the company that you work for to move up, whether it's building a skill that you can sell to people or, you know, doing some artistic, you know, endeavor or whatever it is, uh, and you're spending more time on stuff that's not moving you towards that and you feel that constant sense of shame, it's very easy to drown it out by playing something like a video game. Just being like, well, I'm not living up to my potential. I'm just going to forget about it and play a game right now or play Flesh and Blood or do something like that or buy a box, do something fun. But if you're feeling those emotions, I think honing in on that, paying attention to it and figuring out like what is it that you want to do in life? Who is it that you want to be? And what are the steps you need to take towards it? I think is, you know, the the goal there and recognizing it for yourself because don't let two guys on YouTube tell you, you know, whether you or not you're living up to your potential. Only you truly know that and the people who are very close to you. So figuring that out, I think, is the first step of what your potential is and what you want to achieve achieve in life. And that could take a long time to figure out. Yep. That, that is, that's a pretty good statement, right? It's, and, but we already talked earlier about the addictive personality part, at least we're mm-hmm. doing TCGs and you're not, you know, shooting something gross into your veins or something like that. So maybe you're doing both, but well, I mean, fair enough, fair Yeah, enough. but then that's n- not fair enough. Please don't do that. But yeah, yeah, either way. All right. Well, thank you so much for this. This is, um, Man, you had you had a lot of really good hits on this one. The MMO thing was actually pretty insightful. So either way, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank everyone for watching. We'd love to hear your comments and your feedback and your thoughts on the matter. Um, we'll we'll see how the interaction goes with this video. I, I really have no idea how this one's going to go. So we will see. But thank you, Wes. I appreciate you taking the time. Do you have anything else you wanted to say before we get out of here? Uh, no, I just thank you for having me on. And I, I feel like, you know, I talk a lot. I already know I've had from our chat cast that people mention that, you know, you're a very concise person. You say what you need to say in as little words as possible. And I ramble like crazy. So if anybody's going to get in trouble on this one, it's probably going to be me because I feel like I said way more. So I don't think you have too much to worry about. <laughs> but thank you for having me on. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, my friend. Uh, Please make sure to go if you haven't seen his stuff already. Oh, and I did want to congratulate you. I saw that you crossed that 6.2K or whatever. So you're you're uh, you're ahead of me now. I'm at 6.5. So congr- 6.5, yeah. So you're ahead of me yeah. now. So congratulations on that. And you're going to you. you're gonna continue to... Coming for, coming for DM Armada next. Watch out, Steven. The man's yeah. coming. <laughs> I'm like a third of his subscribers, but I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much. Please go check out his stuff if you haven't already. If nothing else, my friends, go commando. Go commando. I don't know if I'm supposed to say it with you, but I will. I'll actually, I'll leave it. I'll leave that in. Perfect. (laughs) Okay. (laughs)